Thank you, Rick. And thank you, everybody. Let's all have a seat, except for me. <laughs> I get to stand up for the next however long I preach. Oh, I should preach shorter. Now all the people said, Amen. <laughs> it's been a long day, you can tell. Hmm. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 21 tonight, looking, the Lord willing, at verses 15 through 17. Although we do have some things to finish up from last week as well as we did this morning and never made it to what we were planning on preaching this morning. But the message tonight, entitled, You're Never Too Old for Hospitality, last week we were looking at prophets in predestination, immediately preceding this passage where we find a very interesting older disciple whose name got written in the Bible for all of eternity for one thing he did. He exercised hospitality. You know, if I could have my name written in the Bible for just doing one small, simple thing, wouldn't that be a blessing? That's the eternal word of God, folks. Here is a disciple, and he was an old guy. The text makes a point of it. And God honored him by putting his name in Holy Scripture that lasts for all of eternity. And God never inserts anything in the Bible unless it is important. He's not merely giving us a bunch of historic details that have no relevance other than to fill a little bit of space and make the Bible a little bit longer. He put it in there for a reason. I think God is telling us you're never too old for hospitality and there are some incredible great blessings and we'll see some of those tonight Lord willing that are connected to hospitality it's verses 15 through 17 after those days we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem and there went up with us certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one Manasseh of Cyprus an old disciple with whom we should lodge and when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power, and for how you count little things as important, how you count the simple things, sometimes a great deal more highly than the very complex things and those who think themselves quite important and pompous. You delight to use the small people because that proves that you're the great God. Father, we thank you for that. We pray that as we look into your word tonight, you might give us encouragement, you might give us direction, you might give us your guidance and perfect peace as we exercise the spiritual gifts that you've given to each one of us, for we all have those gifts. We pray that we might not fail in the exercise of that which is necessary for the body of Christ. And so, Father, we commit these things to you in Jesus name. Amen. Now you recall that last week we looked at prophets and predestination and tonight I want to finish up just a few passages that we didn't get to cover last week. We got through the prophecy section uh, which was dealing with Philip the evangelist and he had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy and so we talked about prophecy and we talked about that question of female prophecy. We talked about first, prophets could foretell the future, but that didn't mean that they could interpret or imply the, apply the future in the life of another person as pertaining to the will of God. They were merely shown the raw data. Second, we saw that Paul also had the gift of prophecy. And although every place that he went, the prophets in those places said, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be bound and turned over to the Gentiles. And here we find a prophet by the name of Agabus. His name got stuck into the scriptures too, someone we know almost nothing about other than the fact that he gave a prophecy by taking Paul's girdle and tying his own hands with it and saying this is going to be done to the man who owns this girdle when he gets to Jerusalem. Paul had the gift of prophecy more than any of the rest of them and yet he knew that he had to go to Jerusalem. He already knew what God's will was. They were simply declaring what would happen to the man who owned that belt what would happen to Paul when he got to Jerusalem? It was a test for Paul. Will Paul follow through and obey what he knows to be the will of God? 
Third, people who heard the prophecy were not always motivated by the Spirit of God in the advice that they gave. They gave their advice based on the safest thing to do and the avoidance of suffering. And many people today will tell you the same thing. Well, we know the Scripture says that we should do this. We know that we should witness. We know that we should be faithful in our testimony, but it might cost us our job. Or it might cost us some friends. Or it might cost us the fellowship of our family. Or it mess up their Christmas. <laughs> mess up their Christmas because they don't want to have Christ involved of all the funny things. There is suffering if we do what God calls us to do. Fourth, prophecy merely tells what will happen. But prophecy does not predestine what will happen. Predestination has already occurred. Prophecy is based on predestination. Predestination is not based on prophecy. And so we talked about the female prophets. It doesn't say that his daughters were prophetesses. It simply says they prophesied. And so we looked at many places throughout the scripture where the gift of prophecy occurs. And the only other place after the book of Acts, the only other place where a prophetess shows up is Revelation 2.20. And it's by a woman who called herself a prophetess. She wasn't really. But it was the woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my uh, servants to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed unto idols. Clearly, she was not a prophetess from God. It's the only other one that's called a prophetess in the New Testament. There were false prophetesses in the Old Testament as well. We looked at Noadiah in Nehemiah 6.4. We looked at true prophetesses in the Old Testament, but what they were doing was singing the scriptures, such as Miriam in Exodus 15.20. There were those who were involved in temple worship and apparently in the music of the temple who were also called prophetesses. And we saw that in 2 Kings 22, 2 Chronicles 34.22, uh, where a woman by the name of Huldah the prophetess, uh, who was the wife of Hilkiah, uh, and was in the college, it was called, but that was the, the music chamber, if you will. There was in the New Testament, in the book of uh, Luke, there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, uh, and she ministered to the Lord continually in the temple. We find that those who were the wives of prophetesses were called prophets, were called prophetesses, as Isaiah's wife was in Isaiah 8.3. But even in the Old Testament, it was rare for a woman who, to have that kind of a title. Now, what we didn't cover last week, and we spent quite a bit of time on those other passages that I just briefly covered, what we didn't cover last week was predestination and its relationship to prophecy. <clears throat> All prophecy, no matter where you go, any place in the Bible, and one-third of the Bible is prophetic. One-third. So people who don't like prophecy are missing one-third of the Bible, or people who allegorize it away are missing one-third of the Bible. There are many in the Reformed camp who like to allegorize prophecy away and say everything has already taken place and all those things that are about the future in the book of Revelation really isn't going to happen. Uh, it's just sort of an allegory about the church. Dear friends, when God fulfills prophecy, he fulfills it literally and he can do that because he has predestined what will come to pass in precisely the time that it will come to pass. We saw that this morning with the 10th plague. God determines when the end is coming. God told Moses, this is the last one I'm going to send. Moses and the children of Israel and the children of Egypt did not know which would be the last, if at all there would be a last, of all the plagues that God was sending on Egypt. And God said, this is the last one. With this one, I will break Pharaoh. I guarantee you, he will thrust you out with a high hand at this point from the land of Egypt. Because God had predestined it. God had made Pharaoh... God had raised him up at that precise point in history. The book of Romans says so. God says, I've raised you up for this purpose that I might glorify myself. I'm going to crush you like a gnat because I'm going to glorify myself. And God passed judgment on all the gods of Egypt when he crushed Pharaoh. God had predestined it because God had made a promise to Abraham that his seed would be in the land of Egypt for 400 years and then afterward he would bring them out. God said, it's time to do that. I've got an exact date. I have predestined the exact date. I've raised up the right men. I've raised up Pharaoh. I've raised up Moses. I've raised up Aaron. I've raised up the children of Israel. I've raised up that army of people that I'm going to take across the wilderness and bring them into the promised land that I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God did it. Now tonight I want to look at some of the 
passages that deal with that in the New Testament. I've divided them up fairly simply for you. Let me first give you three definitions. First, the definition of predestination. That is simple and obvious to understand. Predestination is to irresistibly determine a destiny or an outcome in advance. To irresistibly determine a destiny or an outcome in advance. And that is based solely on the divine will and the choice of God. And we'll see some passages that say that. Number two, election. Election means to choose for a particular purpose in advance. Not merely to determine the destiny, but to determine the purpose. Election is to choose for a particular purpose in advance. And when we find the word elect, especially in the New Testament, we find it in relation to many different people and beings. Did you know that Christ is called the elect? The holy angels are called the elect angels. Israel is called the elect. Churches as groups of people are called elect. And individual believers are called elect. Now, there is also a confusion among some Reformed theologians. They say, ah, see, it says that Israel here is elect, and since the church is also elect, therefore Israel is the church. No, if you make that non-distinction, then that means that the holy angels are Christ, and the holy angels are Israel, and the churches are holy angels, and believers are Christ. No, it doesn't make any sense. There are different individuals and groups of people and angelic beings that are called elect, and Christ is the elect one, and we'll see that in just a few moments. Then we have the word foreknowledge. Foreknowledge is advanced knowledge of the future based on predestination and election. Foreknowledge is not simply God looking down the corridors of time and seeing what's going to happen and then sort of adjusting his plans to sort of fit into what is going to happen. Because, as I've told you many times before, that makes God subject to history rather than making history subject to God. God is in control of history. History is not in control of God. God is not merely floating along with the current and hoping he can get to the shore. Now let's look at some of the passages. Let's look at some of the ones first that use the word predestination. Ephesians chapter 1, of course the book of Ephesians is a great book for studying predestination and election. But in Ephesians chapter 1, looking at two verses, verse 5 and 11. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Predestination is based on the sovereign will of God. According to the good pleasure of his will. What pleases him, not what pleases us, what pleases him. We've been predestinated unto the adoption of children. You know, children don't choose who their adoptive parents will be. I have a daughter and her husband who have adopted two little boys, and they're in the process of adopting two more. You know, especially those two little guys that I flew with them to China a couple of years ago to adopt those two little boys in China, they didn't get to choose who were going to be their parents. The parents went to a great deal of agony and trouble and expense to choose them. There were many children in the registry that Daniel and Anastasia could have chosen. There were many children that were up for adoption. In fact, originally Daniel and Anastasia were going to adopt one and then one of the home study groups that came by said, you know, you all are so qualified to adopt children. Why don't you adopt another? And so they did. They went back and looked through the registry and they chose another one. And they got two delightful, delightful little boys. It is the adopting parent who chooses the child, not the child who chooses the parent. Verse 11, in whom also we obtained an inheritance, being predestinated, ah, according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. I don't know how much clearer you can get concerning predestination than the statement in verse 11 there. We have an inheritance because we've been predestinated. You know, those little adopted boys are going to be receiving an inheritance someday. Not an inheritance from their natural parents, but an inheritance from the one who adopted them. And it says 
that we were predestinated according to God's purpose. Did you know that God has a purpose for you? That's the reason he chose you. The reason you're predestinated is because God has a specific purpose for your life. And though you and I may be recalcitrant and stubborn and obnoxious and kick and fuss and fight and whine just like lots of little kids do, God is going to guarantee that we accomplish the purpose that he designed for us to accomplish. Because he works all things according to the counsel of his own will. Not according to the counsel of our will. God doesn't sit around and sort of like some modern American parents say, well, now, Johnny, what would you like to do? No, God says, Johnny, you are going to do this. Johnny says, I don't want to. The parent says, you will do this. I won't. All right. Then you will have the uh, Board of Education applied to the seat of learning. And Johnny ends up doing what his parents tell him to do. Well, God is even more sovereign than the parent over the child. And God works all things according to the counsel of his own will. But now let's look at some of the other places where we find election referring to others beside just the elect of the church. How about angels? 1 Timothy 5.21 I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. In other words, Timothy, you're being watched. Yes, you're being watched by other believers, and you are clearly being watched by demonic forces, but you're also being watched by another group, the elect angels, the ones that God chose. You know, there was a war in heaven. There was a great rebellion that took place, and uh, Satan swept one-third of the angels after him. And they fell, and they became what we know today as the demons, the da, the knowing ones. And they watch us, and they watch us, and they watch us, looking for weaknesses and places where we can fall, where they can trip us up. But there's a group that did not follow Satan, and God calls them the elect angels. That tells you something about God's choices in eternity past, even before the creation of the angels. Because God works all things according to the purpose of his own will. There are many passages, of course, that refer to believers as those who are elect, and some that refer to us as the elect prior to our salvation. Let me give you an illustration of that. 2 Timothy 2.10 Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So the believers who have not yet believed are called elect. Titus chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now here we find the effectual means of applying election. This verse is going to deal with the effectual means of applying election. An apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. That's the effectual means of applying election. Now we find it connected to foreknowledge. Remember, we talked about foreknowledge, not just because God looks down the corridors of time and sees what's going to happen, but God, because he has determined in advance what will happen, knows what will happen. And here we find election tied to foreknowledge. 1 Peter 1, 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Then we find the elect in the context of eternal security. Romans 8.33 Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. And if God declares you righteous, which is what justification is all about, if God declares you righteous, who can say that you are not? Because you are made righteous in Christ. And Ephesians chapter 1 deals about being in him, in Christ, in the beloved Three different terms are used in Ephesians chapter 1 to talk about your position in Christ. Ephesians has six chapters. The first three chapters deal with our position in Christ. Positional truth, chapters 1, 2, and 3. Practical truth, chapters 4, 5, and 6. Our position, though, is in Christ. Then we find the love of God for those who are elect. Colossians 3.12 Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. 
The love of God should transform your life. If you're among the elect, the love of God will transform your life. So that you'll have mercy and kindness and humbleness and meekness and long-suffering. Oh, you begin to understand there's some fruit of the Spirit involved here, isn't there? Because if you're elect of God, God's going to be working on you. The Holy Spirit is going to be working in you to conform you to the image of Christ and to transform your mind, to metamorphosize your mind, according to Romans chapters 12, 1 and 2. Now we find Christ referred to as the elect one. 1 Peter 2, 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Peter is quoting the Old Testament. The chief cornerstone is Christ. He's the head of the corner. And he's called the elect one here by Peter. Churches are called elect as groups. John speaks this way in 2 John chapter 1, verse 1, and also 2 John chapter 1, verse 13. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. The elect lady is a church. The same thing in verse 13. The children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. We find individuals who are called elect and given by name. For example, Romans chapter 16, verse 13. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. We find that election and predestination relates to the sovereign choice of God, including his choice concerning salvation. Some people say, well, elect on all these other things, but not for salvation. Yes, the scripture says that God chooses who will be saved. Let me give you those verses. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 and 28. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. And it's by God's choice, not man's free will. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 We are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath, now listen, from the beginning, chosen you to salvation. If you're saved, you have nothing to boast about. You have nothing to boast about for at least two reasons. The first reason is... If you're among God's elect, it's probably because you are the worst thing he could find. That's what Paul said there in that 1 Corinthians 1, 27, 28 passage. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound those things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. And the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. I know I have nothing to boast about. God in his mercy chose me, and for that I'm thankful. But that probably means I was dirt. I was rubbish. Because you see, then God gets the glory. He will not stand to have any flesh glory in his presence. But he chooses those things that are the off-scourings, as Paul uses the word. Off-scourings. When you scrub a pot of the goo that is left over and burned on the pot, that's the off-scourings. Today at lunch, I, I cooked some stuff and a little bit burned on the bottom of the pot, so I had to take steel wool and soap and scrub and scrub and scrub until I got that stuff out. Now, how many of you, after you've scrubbed that gunk out of the bottom of your pots and pans, then fish around in, in the drain and pull it out and eat it. <laughs> Not many of us, right? Now, of course I do, because I never waste anything. No, I'm kidding. Uh, the off-scourings. We want to be so proud and so haughty and so think so much of ourselves, to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Instead, we should think, think soberly, righteously, and godly. Christ is the one who is to be honored. And he chose us so that he can get the glory.
and he chose us to salvation. That's why we can't boast. God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. That's the process he uses. He chooses you first, then he uses the process of setting you apart and bringing you to faith in Christ. Look at the timing of election. Was it sort of God was wandering around earth and he thought, man, I need a few more elect up here to fill some slots in heaven. Let's see, I guess I'll choose that one there. When did God do this? It tells us in Ephesians 1.4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. That's before creation took place. God already had his eternal plan in place in his mind until the moment in eternity when he spoke time into existence and brought to pass everything for the last 6,000 years to come down to you today. And he called you by name. He chose you, and he regenerated you, and he gave you the breath of life. That's a sovereign God. He made his choice in eternity past before he even created anything. It wasn't a stopgap measure after he'd created and the devil sinned and God said, what am I going to do now? And then, 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 then Adam and Eve said, oh man, what am I going to do now? wasn't what happened with God before anything ever was created he chose you before the foundation of the world you see that's why prophecy is subject to predestination and not predestination subject to prophecy God chose you for a purpose too he chose you for service and for warfare 2 Timothy 2 4 no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You have been chosen to be a soldier. Many other things as well, but you have been chosen to be a soldier. Tell me, what happens to soldiers who go AWOL? What happens to soldiers who turn tail and run in the heat of the battle? What happens to soldiers who lie on their bunks in their barracks when Reveille is blown in the morning? My dad told me a story back when he was in the military in World War II. He said uh, they had a really tough sergeant. I mean, he was mean. He was hard as nails. And he really pounded the guys. And one guy had slept in in the morning, hadn't gotten up for Reveille, and that sergeant came in and kicked him in the small of his back and knocked him right out of his bed. But you know, at the end of basic training, that man had tears in his eyes. and He said, men, I've done everything I can to make you into men because some of you are going to die. And I love you and I don't want to see you die. Oh, that we might learn what it means to be men in God's army. Not those who just sort of piddle around with church and show up when we will and show up when we won't and do our own thing and putter in and out and never take the bull by the horns and say, I am in the army and I'm here to fight for Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him. You've got a calling to please God, not just to sort of be there on occasion. That he may please him that hath chosen him to be a soldier. Now that brings us to our message for tonight. You're never too old for hospitality. I've read you those verses. The one that's our key verse is verse 16. And brought with them one Manasin of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. Do you know how important hospitality is in the New Testament? It is all over the New Testament. It's an absolute essential in the body of Christ. It was essential not only in the early church, but it is essential today. There are places around the world 
where it has to be exercised for some very specific purposes, whereas we find ourselves insulated from those purposes because our homes are our castles. That's our barricade against the outside world. That's our barricade against the church. That's the place where we can go to hang out and we don't have to worry about other people. But in the early church, many churches met in homes. Let me give you four illustrations, four different homes. There are more than that, but I'll just give you four of them because some of the others I'm going to talk about a little bit later on. Churches that met in homes, Romans 16, 5. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. 1 Corinthians 16, 19. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Colossians 4, 15. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church which is in his house. Philemon 1, 2. And to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Most of us wouldn't even think of it. Now, you know, we're a small enough group. We don't have what this auditorium seats, 1,300 people. I suspect most of us here, if we really tried, to get the entire Sunday morning worship service into our house if we had to. But we rarely do it even for special occasions. Early church saw it as the norm. Traveling ministers stayed in homes. Look at Acts 16, for example. Starting in verse 14, a certain woman named Lydia, seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of by Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me faithful to the Lord, come unto my house and abide there. And she constrained us. She provided lodging for Paul and his entire team. It wasn't just like one service or one meal. They get arrested, as you know, in that passage, get thrown into jail. They get beaten. And uh, then the sergeants find out that they are... Um, Roman citizens, and there is a pro or the magistrates find out they're Roman citizens, and uh, so they beg them to leave town. And we get down to verses 38 and following, and it says, The sergeants told these words unto the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and besought them, and brought them out, and desired them to depart out of the city. And they went out of prison, and listen, entered into the house of Lydia, and when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. Lydia's house had become the center for Bible study and worship. Titus chapter 3 verse 13 brings Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey diligently that nothing be wanting unto them. Uh, nothing except a, a place to stay, of course. They're on their own for that. No, I don't think so. We find other Bible studies held in homes with Aquila and Priscilla. Dealing with Apollos, it says, Acts 18, 24 through 26. A certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. Now this is after Paul has just left to head back to Jerusalem. And so Apollos shows up. Now Paul had been living with Aquila and Priscilla and working with them because they were of the same trade. They were tent makers. So now along comes, comes this young man. He preaches in the synagogue. The only thing he knows about is the baptism of John. Mighty in the scriptures, he came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in the spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John, and began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom, when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Discipleship programs going on in their house. Believers suffering persecution in the early church shared their homes. In fact, that's taking place today. Every time there has been persecution in any country, other believers have willingly opened their homes for Christians who are running away. Sometimes it's caused that second group of Christians their own home, and in some cases their lives. How much do you love your house? The material things God has given you. How much do you love your stuff? You wouldn't want 
other Christians to come in because they might walk off with something. Or, you know, if, if they came in, they might disrupt your family's lifestyle and uh, you really couldn't afford to take care of them. What if it was, like I said this morning, World War II and you were in Germany or in one of the lowland countries where the Nazis rolled across in a blitzkrieg? They billeted their soldiers wherever they wanted. You didn't have a choice there. But what if you had some neighbors who were Jews? Or someone came and knocked in the night and said, I hear you're a Christian. Will you help me out? I'm Jewish. Would you have opened your home? Early church did. Hospitality is required of elders. It tells us in two places that they have to be given to or addicted to hospitality. That means earnestly desiring hospitality. You see, a man is best seen in his home setting. He must be one who models hospitality, opens his home for others. He's someone who clearly has the spiritual gift of hospitality. First Timothy 3.2, a bishop then, that's an overseer, and that's not just talking about the Catholic Church concept of bishops, or the Episcopalian Church, or the Church of England concept of bishops. A bishop is an overseer, he's, a, he's an elder, as he see the parallel passages. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. It must be something that drives him. He loves to do it. Titus 1, 7 and 8, For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Now, if you went through these lists, and on that first one, for example, um, bishop then must be blameless, husband of one wife, vigilant, sober of good behavior. We can leave out of good behavior, right? No, no, well, let's, let's leave out the one about vigilant. He doesn't really have to watch out for the flock. Let's leave out the one about sober. But we leave out the one about given to hospitality. And that second one, we can, let's say, uh, well, you know, he's really a drunk, so we'll leave that requirement out. It says, uh, not given to wine. Just forget that one. Man, he, he's somebody who's always running after money, so let's, let's leave that one out that says, not given to filthy lucre. That's the one that's right before, but a lover of hospitality. Nothing is written in God's word that God did not have a purpose for. You see... It's in the home setting that a man is most clearly seen in his character and in the relationship that he has with his family. Given to hospitality, a lover of hospitality. Widows had to have exercised hospitality to be taken care of by the church after their husbands died. 1 Timothy 5, 9, let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man, so she's got to be at least 60. Verse 10, well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged friends and relatives, right? Or uh, real important preachers. That's not what it says. If she have lodged strangers. If she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. Church was not supposed to take care of any widow who didn't have those qualifications. Rather significant. Hospitality, you say, well, no, I don't have the gift of hospitality, so I'm out of there, right? We talked about the 22 different spiritual gifts. We talked about the seven temporary gifts. We talked about the 15 permanent gifts. And some are just for men. And so all you ladies can, you know, don't have that one. But hospitality is one of the every believer gifts. Scripture says so. This is a gift that you have. The question is, are you using it? 1 Peter 4, 9 and 10. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. And I mean, that means, man, I wish I didn't have to do this. But, you know, the preacher preached about it. And so I guess that I'm going to have to, you know, I guess I'm going to have to exercise some hospitality. 
And after all, that way I can check it off my list and it leaves my conscience. Uh, I don't have it. No, no, I don't have it. Oh, yeah? Look at verse 10. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Hospitality is a spiritual gift and is a manifestation of the grace of God. And if you are not exercising it, it means you are not a good steward. That's what he just said. Use hospitality one to another without grudging, as every man hath received the gift. Even so, minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God exercises his grace through you to other Christians with hospitality. Do you begin to understand why Manasseh got his name stuck in the Bible? Why his name is permanently engraved in Scripture in heaven forever for all of eternity? And he was an old guy. He provided a place for the Apostle Paul and his traveling companions. And he got his name in an eternal book. Pretty good switch off, I think. Romans chapter 12. Again, a passage dealing with all believers. And we find in it hospitality. Which of these things can you say don't affect all believers? Beginning in verse 9, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints. This all applies, it applies to all of us, right? All of those things apply to us, right? I think so. Next thing. After distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. All of us are supposed to be exercising hospitality. The gift of hospitality is given to every believer to increase love and the unity of fellowship in the church, to provide lodging and food for other believers who are in fellowship, and to care for other believers who are suffering persecution and genuine needs. 1 Peter 4, 8, 9, remember? Above all things, above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Very next verse. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. When I read it to you the first time, I didn't give you that verse 8. God puts it first. Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity covers the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. You know, those three verses make it clear. If you have a place to live, it's not yours. It belongs to God. You should be using it cheerfully on a regular basis for at least one of the three purposes stated in that definition I just read to you, which I wrote probably 40 years ago. Number one, to increase love and unity in the church. Number two, to provide food and lodging for godly Christians. Number three, to meet the needs of persecuted and suffering Christians. But then we have to put in a caveat. Hospitality must be restricted to exclude those who teach false doctrine. To exclude those who teach false doctrine. John talks about that in his second epistle, 2 John verses 8 through 11. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, now here we get to the issue of hospitality. Receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. That is, like we would say today, have a good day. 
Don't even say have a good day. You hope he has a rotten day. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. There's a warning against who you should not exercise hospitality with. But now let's think of some of the people who got blessed because they exercised hospitality. Think about the blessing that they received when the two who were on the road to Emmaus invited Jesus in for supper. Somebody they didn't know, he was a stranger to them, but as they walked and talked, they said, man, this guy sure knows his Bible. It says, Jesus expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. After he'd broken the bread and disappeared and they recognized who he was, they said, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened the scriptures to us in the way? Suppose, because it says Jesus made as though he would have gone on farther. And if those two had not invited him in, he would have gone on. Book of Revelation, Jesus talks about opening the door. He's knocking at the door. He's standing at the door. Wants to come in. And that's not a salvation verse. That's a fellowship verse. How often have we kept the door closed? What have we missed by keeping the door closed? After all, it's our house. After all, we really don't want to be bothered here. This is the place where we kick off our shoes, sit down in front of the TV with a bowl of popcorn, and watch the game. I wonder in eternity how much time we will have spent in inane activities when we could have been ministering to other believers in need. That's one group to think of, the two on the road to Emmaus. What a blessing they received inviting Jesus in for supper. Think about the Last Supper. We normally think about Jesus and the Twelve and Judas and the betrayal and Jesus' foot washing and all the other things that take place in that story. But some unknown follower of Jesus prepared a room for the Passover. And then he provided the entire Passover feast for 13 men, the Lord and his disciples, as well as his own family, who which ate someplace else. We don't know the name of the one who offered that hospitality, but God knows. God has certainly rewarded him or her. You know, when Jesus sent the two disciples into the city, they had no idea where they were going. Jesus had just said, when you get in the city, you'll see a guy carrying a pitcher of water. He would have stood out because it was usually the women who carried the pitchers of water. But just as you get into the city gate, you're going to see a guy with, carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Follow him, and when you get to the house, tell the master of the house, the Lord needs to have a room prepared for the Passover here. And he'll show you a large upper room furnished. There, make ready for me. We don't even know his name. We don't know the names of the two on the road to Emmaus, so I think I can guess who they were. But somebody exercised hospitality for the Last Supper. And our entire service of communion is based on the hospitality of some unknown person in Jerusalem just before the crucifixion. What blessing did they receive? Think about the time and the blessing that Abraham received when three strangers stopped by his tent. And then we discover that one of those is the Lord himself with two angelic beings 
who then go on down to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But because Abraham exercised hospitality and he begins to realize that the third one is a theophany, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament, he begins to bargain with him. Will you destroy the city of 50 people, righteous people can be found? How about 40, 30, 20, 10? No, I won't destroy it, even if there are that many. Abraham thinks I can't push it any further, but I know Lot is down there. Because of his hospitality, God revealed what he was about to do, and he spared Lot and his daughters. One more incredible reference to hospitality. There are many, many more, but just one more that I'd like to share with you. It also is in the context of the crucifixion, just like the hospitality of those on the road to Emmaus and the hospitable room and feast offered to the Last Supper. It's in John 19, beginning in verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. My thought is the two on the road to Emmaus were Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Cleopas. Verse 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. John cared for Mary through her remaining years of life because of his love for Christ. You know, a lot more could be said about this, including all those things which we've just discussed, all the different categories of hospitality and where it's required and all the things that go along with it. Let me read you just one final passage. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Let brotherly love continue. Is that important? How do you express it? It tells you in the next verse. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Abraham did not know it when the three strangers showed up at his door. But he knew they were from God. Hospitality. You're never too old for hospitality. It's an every believer gift. It's a gift that you and I should be offering to others as well. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. We pray for your blessings on our study tonight, that you will move us to practical action, not merely to ethereal theology. That we will learn to understand that what we have does not belong to us. It belongs to you. We are only your stewards. And someday we will have to give an account for what we have done with our stewardship. Father, we pray that you will glorify your Son in us and through us in the exercise of this every believer gift so that the body of Christ might be edified, believers might be encouraged, there might be the growth of fellowship and love and communion among the body of Christ to the glory of Christ. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>